So anyway, I'm going to talk to you about osteoporosis after organ transplant, and these, these are my disclosures. And I thought I would start with a case, and this is actually one of my patients who um, presented uh, in the 90s when I first got interested in this problem of osteoporosis after transplant. And he was like this 49-year-old guy, which seems really old to you, but was pretty, you know, still pretty robust. And he, um, he developed a viral cardiomyopathy. And he, he, he wasn't sick for very long. He had a rapid downhill course over a period of six months from the time he first got sick to the time he was transplanted. So pretty short. He wasn't chronically ill for years like someone with congenital heart disease might be. And he had a heart transplant, and then about two months after the heart transplant, he developed acute back pain when he bent over to pick up a package. And this is very typical of a vertebral compression fracture. You bend over to do something that ordinarily wouldn't be a problem, and he developed this acute back pain, and he saw the doctors, and they said, oh, it'll get better, don't worry about it. And it did, but then he had a bunch of other episodes of the same thing over the next six months, and finally, about eight months after his transplant, uh, someone did a spine film, and he had seven vertebral fractures. And he was six foot two before his transplant. He lost four inches of height. He was now 5'10". And because of these multiple vertebral compression fractures, he had a new lease on life from his heart transplant, but the fractures really impacted very negatively upon his quality of life. He had a marked kyphosis. He was in chronic pain. He was a really great guy um, who worked very hard for the transplant program, tried to raise money and ed do work educating other people, and he had a real positive attitude, but it really did um, impact on his quality of life. Yes? Was he on steroids for a long time before the transplant? No, not at all. He was not on steroids until, until the transplant. So what I'm going to cover today is I'm going to talk about um, a little bit about the uh, presence of skeletal disease in people who have, are waiting for transplant. So before they ever come to transplant, they have a problem. I don't think that applies to this man because he wasn't sick for long enough. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the epidemiology and, and pathogenesis of osteoporosis after transplant, including uh, bone mass deterioration and fracture incidence. Then I'm going to talk about clinical trials that um, look at prevention of bone loss after transplant and prevention of fractures. Um, and then I'm going to talk about a little bit how to manage bone disease post-transplant um, in um, heart, lung, and liver, and then separately kidney transplant because it's a much more complicated situation. So starting with skeletal disease in patients waiting for transplant, um, there's a study from 2010, which I think is about the most recent comprehensive one that looked at the prevalence of osteoporosis by DEXA criteria, T-score below minus 2.5, in people who are waiting for a transplant. And you can see that, um, that almost a quarter, oh, it doesn't work. Oh, it doesn't work? Well, you you just squeeze your hand again. <laughs> okay. All right, um, so you can see that almost a quarter of people who are awaiting transplant already have osteoporosis by DEXA criteria uh, before they are transplanted. About a third of people who are waiting for a liver transplant already have osteoporosis, and two-thirds of people who are waiting for a lung transplant already have osteoporosis. And what are the causes of low BMD in candidates awaiting transplantation? Well, in general, um, there are some specifics that I'll come to in a few minutes about different types of transplant. But in general, um, they're older. Um, many of the women are postmenopausal, not all, of course. Um, sometimes the things that have gotten them to the transplant, like smoking and alcohol, um, can, those can also have adverse effects on bone. They've taken drugs, loop diuretics, heparin, steroids before that affect their bone mass. Uh, ma many of them are quite ill, and so they're physically inactive. They may have diabetes. And uh, they are the last thing they're worrying about is whether they're getting enough calcium and vitamin D. So some of them have calcium deficient diets and vitamin D deficiency. And we looked at the vitamin D deficiency incident, um, prevalence of vitamin D deficiency in patients who were just transplanted that week at, at Columbia. We did this 
and we uh, looked at serum 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels in um, heart transplant patients in yellow and liver transplant patients in blue, and you can see that almost no one was normal if you define normal as above 30 nanograms per ml, and if you define normal above 20, you're still the vast majority of patients have uh, low 25 hydroxy D levels immediately at the time of transplant. So this is a big problem. Now it's possible, especially with the liver patients, that the serum levels of free 25 hydroxy D may not be as low as the total uh, uh, because the liver may not make the binding, D binding globulin to the same extent, so it may be not as bad as it looks if you just measure total D levels, but it is certainly um, a problem that we see a lot. And then the other thing is that everybody who comes to transplant has end-stage disease of the organ that it's about to be transplanted. And so each type of end-stage disease has its own constellation of risk factors for low bone mass and fractures. Um, um, in patients with heart failure, um, they very often tend to have uh, low creatinine clearances. They have a lot of uh, diuretic exposure to loop diuretics, which cause calcium losses in the urine. Uh, many of them have to take chronic heparin, which causes a form of osteoporosis. Obviously, they aren't very active. They're vitamin D deficient. And a lot of people awaiting transplant for heart transplants have secondary hyperparathyroidism, which can drive bone loss. And then finally, many of them are chronically ill and hypogonadal, especially the women, yes? What is the mechanism by which heparin causes osteoporosis? Nobody really knows that very well, but it, 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 it's a direct effect on the osteoblast, we think. And is it the same for lobanos? Probably, although not as severe as just plain heparin. Um, for chronic lung disease, the vast majority of patients with chronic lung disease have exposure to glucocorticoids, which is a well-known cause of osteoporosis. They have hypoxemia and, me and metabolic a and respiratory acidosis sometimes, which can, and acidosis causes um, um, uh, os activation of osteoclasts. Uh, they are very cachectic with very low BMI. Um, they have obviously, most of them had tobacco exposure, although not all. And then the subset of, of lung transplant recipients with cystic fibrosis have a constellation of factors that puts them at increased risk for osteoporosis. Many of them have very low po peak bone mass to start with. Uh, many of them have pancreatic insufficiency, so they malabsorb um, calcium and vitamin D. And many of them are, are hypogonadal, relatively speaking, with very delayed um, puberty and decreased uh, um, production of testosterone and estrogen. So they have their own set of factors that are unique to them. And patients with end-stage liver disease, um, many have HCV infections, which have been associated with osteoporosis. Of course, alcohol use is very common. Uh, hemochromatosis uh, can cause osteoporosis, or is associated with it by an unclear mechanism. Cirrhosis encephalopathy, and they may fall more because of that. And primary biliary cirrhosis causes chronic cholestasis with, um, and high bilirubin levels suppress osteoblast activity. So they have a very um, uh, common a low turnover form of osteoporosis. And then, of course, the vitamin D deficiency that I showed you. And then the most complicated are the patients with chronic kidney disease or end-stage kidney disease because the this is really associated with very complex disturbances in bone and mineral metabolism with um, hypocalcemia, hyperphosphatemia, calcitriol deficiency, and secondary hyperparathyroidism. And then often they will have type 1 diabetes, which led to their diabetic nephropathy and end-stage renal disease. And type 1 diabetes is associated with low bone mass and fractures, hypogonadism, secondary to uremia, obviously a cause of low bone mass and fractures. Often they've had a lot of exposure to diuretics, glucocorticoids, and cyclosporin. Um, dialysis itself is associated with fractures and peripheral vascular disease as well. And then if they've had a prior kidney transplant before this, they're at higher risk. So each sort of, of the major organs that are transplanted that have been studied in detail has their own sort of set of things and some intersect in a Venn diagram and others are unique to that particular situation.
So um, low bone mass is common, but so are fractures in patients with organ failure. Um, and here's a bunch of uh, references that look at the um, risk factors for fracture in patients with liver disease, um, some of the things I mentioned before in the risk factors for low bone mass. Um, kidney failure, um, again, uh, patients over 67 who start dialysis have more fractures. Heart failure, I'm not sure why this would be, uh, but there are several studies now that show that people with heart failure have an increased risk of fracture. And finally, lungs, lung disease also um, have an increased risk of fracture, and that's been shown on multiple studies. So people come to transplant almost always, except for my patient who I don't believe really had a very compromised skeleton, but they often come to transplant with an unhealthy skeleton for a variety of reasons, and then they are transplanted. And so I think the insult of transplantation is often superimposed upon multiple chronic insults that have compromised their skeletal strength and bone mass. So um, what about people who have had organ transplants? Well, um, here is sort of a review that I did a while ago looking at uh, various studies that quantified the rate of bone loss during the first year after transplantation. And you can see that um, depending on the organ, the rates range from nothing to as high as 24% in liver, although this was a very small study that only included patients with primary biliary cirrhosis. But fairly substantial rates of bone loss um, during the first year after transplantation. And then in terms of fracture incidence, anywhere from very low to very high, the 3% was in people only with clinical fractures, um, not with x-rays documentation. So anyway, anywhere up to 65% of people will have a fracture after a transplant. Now, these were older data that were acquired mostly in the 1990s and early 2000s, and I think more recent studies show lower rates of bone loss and fracture, and I'll, I'll show you some evidence for that. Now, what about the prevalence of osteoporosis in long-term transplant recipients? So we talked about before transplant, we talked about the first year after transplant. What about people out there who've never had an evaluation and, you know, they were transplanted five years ago? So um, the uh, prevalence of osteoporosis by BMD criteria depends on the organ, is most common in people who've had a lung transplant. Um, and is probably anywhere from 45 to 55 percent in people who have had other types of transplants. Um, sorry, the people, uh, the presence of osteoporosis by bone density criteria. And then the presence, uh, the fracture prevalence, about 50, 40 to 50 percent, 35 to 50 percent, depending on the type of transplant. Again, these are older data, and it's probable that nowadays that it's not as bad as that. Now, what, is, what happens after transplant that, that, that um, leads to this situation? Uh, well, probably it's immunosuppressive therapy. And most um, uh, types of transplants have at least some exposure to glucocorticoids, although recently kidney transplant patients are, are often transplanted in a steroid-free environment, but that's fairly recent. So they get glucocorticoids, and then they get ca uh, calcineurin inhibitors. Used to be cyclosporin A was more common, and nowadays tecrolimus is more common. And you all know I, um, that glucocorticoids are um, the most common cause, uh, secondary cause of osteoporosis. Um, and they do this by profoundly, their major effect is to profoundly decrease bone formation. And they do this by direct effects on the osteoblast. They decrease the, the number of osteoblasts. They decrease the function of them to synthesize osteoid. And they shorten their survival. They increase um, slightly bone resorption. Their effect on resorption is not as profound as the effect on formation. But there is an early increase um, in bone resorption to, um, by via osteoclast numbers and maturations. So they increase the rate at which osteoclasts form and mature. They increase 
the osteoblast production of rank ligand, which stimulates the osteoclast formation, and they decrease the osteoblast production of osteoprotogerin, or OPG, which would decrease um, uh, osteoclast maturation. So, um, so that all goes towards an increase in formation and a decrease in re resorption. And then they also have an effect on osteocytes. Um, which uh, they increase the death of osteocytes in preformed in previously formed bone, and this somehow, which in a way I don't really understand well, has a direct effect to decrease bone strength. What about other glucocorticoid effects that are bad for bone? Well, they decrease uh, the production of insulin-like growth factor one, which is a bone anabolic agent. They inhibit gonadal steroid production. They decrease intestinal calcium absorption. They cause uh, uh, myopathy, decrease muscle mass and strength, so you're more prone to fall, and there's less tension on the bone. And, and then most people are less physically active. So all of those things are bad for the skeleton. And in addition, they increase urinary calcium excretion at least early on. And there um, is at least in the transplant situation an increase in PTH secretion. And uh, this doesn't, may not apply to all forms of steroid-induced osteoporosis, but it's been documented repeatedly in patients with, um, who are on, who are, who've been transplanted and that they have an increase in PTH, particularly in heart failure patients. So then, in addition to all these really bad things, they also get the calcineurin inhibitor. And calcineurin inhibitors were initially thought to actually going to be bone sparing because they inhibit the activation of nuclear factor um, and fat. And this is a key regulator of T cell function, and that's how they work. But um, N fat is also a key transcription factor for both osteoblasts and osteoclasts. And in vitro, the studies suggested that um, calcineurin inhibitors would inhibit osteoclast function and inhibit um, osteoblast formation. So they suspected that in humans, uh, calcineurin inhibitors were going to cause low bone turnover. Um, but in fact, what they found in animal studies was that there was high bone turnover, markedly increased resorption and formation, very rapid, severe cancellous bone loss, and this is with cyclosporin. And when they tried tacrolimus, they found similar effects in animal studies, although maybe not as severe as cyclosporin. And all of these changes could be prevented by anti-resorptive drugs. And they tried estrogen, bisphosphonates, calcitonin, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, this work was pretty much all done by Dr. Saul Epstein and his colleagues in the early 1990s. And here is a slide that he shared uh, with me. Um, this is rat tibia. This is mineralized bone. This is osteoid. This is marrow. This is cortex. This is trabecular bone. And this is in a rat before they were treated with cyclosporin A. And this is in a rat after 21 days of cyclosporin A at 7 milligrams per kilogram per day and um, at a dose equivalent to that, which would be a dose equivalent to what a human would have gotten on the high end of the spectrum. And so you can see that there was a very dramatic effect, particularly in cancellous bone. So basically, it's a multifactorial um, uh, pathogenesis. And it kind of depends on the patient and their particular milieu. Uh, you have um, the effect of pre-transplant bone disease, possible hypogonadism, vitamin D deficiency, hyperparathyroidism, and renal insufficiency. And um, then you add glucocorticoids, which suppress bone formation, and cyclosporin, or the calcineurin inhibitors, which probably increase bone resorption. And so what you have is a profound uncoupling. Um, that is even more clinically profound in the older days, anyway, than what you see with just ordinary steroids alone. So I always thought of it as a combination of these two drugs, one which suppressed formation, the other which markedly increased resorption, causing very um, marked uncoupling for a short period of time, and that this would lead to rapid bone loss and fractures. And here are some uh, data from, from several studies that have been done over the years, um, dating back uh, to the 1990s, looking at the natural history of 
bone loss at the lumbar spine um, after a heart transplant. And you can see that in, you know, by the time six months is gone, people have lost anywhere from six to eight percent at the spine. If you think about a woman going into menopause, they might use, lose two percent a year. These people are losing eight percent in six months. And then it kind of levels off and there may be some recovery. But the, to return to what I mentioned about things being better now than they were in the 1990s, these are three studies that were all done in, by our group. And in 1997, we found a rate of bone loss of about 8%. And then when we did a clinical trial with an untreated control group in 2004, that was about less, than, there was less than half the bone loss that there was before. And then when we did another later clinical trial, it was about 2% at the spine. So probably because of reductions in the um, prevalence of steroid or the dose of steroid people were using and probably because of switching from cyclosporin A to perhaps um, FK506 or uh, tacrolimus, there has been less bone loss than, than before. These are all untreated patients or patients who received only calcium and vitamin D but no other drug to prevent bone loss. And then to speak to that issue that I mentioned of uncoupling, these are from the first 1997 study that showed this is a osteocalcin, a, a formation marker, and you can see that this is pre-transplant, and then there was marked, marked suppression of osteocalcin, and then gradually as steroids were lowered, the recovery of bone formation back to baseline. And here we have the marker of resorption that we were using at that time, urine deoxypyridinolin, so you can see that that went up so that people these people were sort of high turnover before they came to their transplant, then they were uncoupled, and then they came back to high turnover again. So it's actually, if you remember back to the slide before, it was the first six months um, that there was the most rapid bone loss and the high, and we also found very high fracture rates at that period of time. So something about this uncoupling, we think, is very detrimental to the bone. And what we think is going on is that this is a scanning electron micrograph of a bone biopsy from a transplant patient. And this is a spicule or a trabecular of bone. And this is, re this is resorption cavities. So you can see that this trabecular is basically being eaten away. There are these big divots being you know, chomped out of it and that it wouldn't take very much for that to break. And so we th I think that during this period, this is what's ha going on, and this very acute um, increase in resorption with no opportunity to form new bone results in this destabilization of the trabecular network and leads to acute fractures. And these are some of the data that suggest that fractures do occur fairly early during the first couple of years after heart transplant. This is our 1996 study, and we showed that um, almost, a, you know, over a third of the patients had a fracture, most of them in the, first, in the first year, and most of these fractures were in the first three to six months. And this is a study out of Germany that basically showed, it was a little bit later, but showed approximately the same rate. And this was our 2004 study that showed that rate was cut in half. And this was also um, s supported by another study uh, in 2007 that showed also about a rate of 15%. On the other hand, 15% fracture rate in the first couple of years after a transplant is still not ideal. So uh, we feel there's room for improvement. This is heart transplant. Um, kidney transplants have a very high risk of uh, fractures. Um, this is taken from different studies, so they can't be directly repaired, but each study compared um, fracture risk to um, patients um, after um, patients with normal um, with this is like patients with normal kidney function, and this shows the risk of fracture in patients who have chronic kidney disease stages three and four. So there's a twofold increased risk of fracture in people who only have CKD. On dialysis, there's a fourfold increase in risk of fracture. And then when they get transplanted, that risk goes up further. Now again, these are de not data from the same study, so we can't directly compare them. These are separate studies that look at the risk of fracture 
um, in compared to patients with healthy kidney function. But it looks like even after transplant, even though dialysis um, is associated with a very high fracture risk, that this goes up even further after transplant. We also um, have some data that came from um, our group here um, looking at glucocorticoid-free regimens in terms of uh, bone loss. And so we had, I've um, forgotten how many, I think it was about 50 patients who were followed after um, kidney transplant with a gluco uh, glucocorticoid-free regimen. So they had three days of glucocorticoids right around the time of transplant, and then they were sent home off of steroids, and they were just maintained on FK506. And we didn't really see any change in the spine bone density. In the hip, there was a transient 1 to 2 percent decrease, not very impressive. But at the forearm, which is a PTH-sensitive site, we saw progressive declines in bone density at both the um, one-third radius and the ultradistal radius. It wasn't a huge decrease, one, you know, 2 to 3 percent but it was still significant and progressive. And when we looked at that with our, um, with our high resolution um, peripheral QCT <coughs> machine, we could see that there were um, a, a losses in cortical bone, um, cortical density went down, cortical thickness went down, the amount of cortical bone went down the cortical area, um, and there was a slight increase in trabecular area and a very marked decrease in trabecular density. So even though with ordinary techniques like DEXA, we don't detect any bone loss in patients who've had a kidney transplant and are off steroids after, by the time they go home, um, we still see when we look at more um, higher resolution measurements at the proximal, at the distal skeleton that are PTH sensitive, we see that there is ongoing loss. And we found that um, this loss was directly related to PTH levels. So the higher their post-transplant PTH was and the higher their post-transplant bone turnover markers, the more bone they lost at the, at the distal radius. And we also found when we measured bone stiffness or strength by finite element analysis that that went down as well. So things are still going on. And what might be the mechanism of that? Well, here we have our, our HRP QCT machine. We're measuring uh, uh, the uh, bone at uh, cortical bone and trabecular bone at baseline. And then we um, register the one year image to the baseline image. And we look at areas where there's been loss of cortical bone on the registered image. And the red equals the loss of cortical bone over one year. And if and you can see these, this is the measurement of cortical pores that we can do with this machine. You can see this is the cortical porosity at baseline and look a year later. So there's really a big decrease in cortical porosity and again, this was related to PTH. So the, so the more persistent hyperparathyroidism people have after their kidney transplant, the more cortical bone they're going to lose. And we think of trabecular bone as being very important, but cortical bone makes up 85% of the skeleton. So there may still be subtle changes going on that we can't detect by DEXA or very well by DEXA that may impact these patients' skeleton, skeletal strength over time. Yes? Uh, and the vitamin D was uh, adequate in this patient? Yes. Yes. They all had, they were all on vitamin D. Okay, what about fractures in kin kidney transplant recipients? Um, there was a systematic review of 10 studies involving more than 250,000 patients, and they found um, a highly variable incidence rate of fracture, ranging from 3.3 to almost 100 fractures per thousand person years. And the risk factors were not unexpected, older age, female gender, history of pre-transplant diabetes or dialysis, a prior fracture, or a deceased donor, which is a little surprising. I don't know why that would be. Um, but they did also find that there was a change in the temporal trend in hip fracture between 1997 and 2000. So over that period of time, almost 600 people had hip fractures after their kidney transplant um, of almost 70,000 people. The incidence rate was about, over that whole period of time, was almost four per thousand person years. But if you looked at 2010 compared to 1997, 
the more recently transplanted people had about half the risk of hip fracture as the previously transplanted people. And that may be because many of these people were on steroid-free regimens already, or at least were on lower doses. So turning to prevention, yes? Even this year, it's also increased the number of patients that go to transplant. I mean, compared to 90 more patients than to that Well, this is the risk per 1,000 patients. Yeah. So I don't think that that would have any bearing on it. So um, because we're trying to use the denominator of how many people were transplanted during that time, so and then how many fractures occurred. So if you look at that in 2010 versus 1997, even if there are more people being transplanted, I don't think so. And I. I'm not sure that there are a lot more people being transplanted. I think the problem is the availability of organs. So there's just not enough organs to go along. So probably about 12 to 14,000 people have kidney transplants a year in this country. And maybe um, only 8,000 have, 8, have, have heart transplants. And it's really driven by the supply of organs. So even though we can do it, we can't do it without an organ. So prevention. So the main uh, approaches to prevention of post-transplant bone loss in the past have been bisphosphonates either with um, active vitamin D metabolites or active vitamin D metabolites on their own. And both of these approaches, active vitamin D and bisphosphonates, both have the effect of reducing bone resorption by decreasing osteoclast number and activity and they have both been shown to increase bone density and reduce vertebral fracture rates in patients on glucocorticoids for other reasons, not transplant. So for those reasons, they were the first things tried in transplant patients. And the other thing about active vitamin D metabolites in, um, uh, as opposed to bisphosphonates, they also increase intestinal calcium absorption and they decrease PTH secretion. Um, and that's probably the mechanism by which they decrease bone resorption. So you could even make the case to give both because if you treat with a bisphosphonate, you'll suppress bone resorption directly, and if you treat with a uh, active vitamin D metabolite 2, you would improve calcium absorption and lower PTH. So it might actually have a beneficial effect to, to use both together. So there have been zillions of studies that have looked at prevention of early post-transplant bone loss, and I've just kind of summarized them here. They include studies that just looked at active D metabolites, studies that looked at oral bisphosphonates, alendronate, resedronate, IV bisphosphonates, pomidronate, zoledronic acid, and abandronate, and then one study fairly recently published that looked at denosumab. And basically, most of the studies show that early intervention, no matter what you do, it prevents bone loss or increases bone density. And this has been shown for the kidney, the liver, the heart, and the lung. And I'm just going to show you a few examples of some of the nicer studies. This is a study that was published in the Annals of Internal Medicine of two, in 2006. And they took 62 patients who had had a liver transplant, and they randomized them two weeks after transplant to either placebo or zoledronic acid. And they used a very high dose of zoledronic acid compared to what we're used to as endocrinologists. They gave four milligrams um, right away, right after the transplant, then um, uh, one week after, and then another four milligrams at one month, three, six, and nine months post-transplant. So that's almost like a cancer dose that we would use. <clears throat> and in the zoledronic acid group, they really not only did they didn't see any bone loss early, and they actually had a significant increase. This is at the spine, and this is at the femoral neck, no bone loss at all, and also at the total hip. Whereas in the placebo group, there was a significant loss of about 4% of the spine that recovered. This is the typical pattern after a liver transplant anyway, whether or not you do anything. They usually recover by a year. Um, and then in the, uh, at the femoral neck, about a 4% four or 5% four decrease with no recovery, and similarly at the total hip. So a nice study, but it was not really powered to look at fractures. There were only 60, you know, 30 patients basically per treatment arm, so 
they didn't even report fractures. So yes. You don't have to have osteopenia or anything? <coughs> no. Just because um, <coughs> our feeling at the time was that the decreases were so huge and the people were having fractures. We had data in our heart transplant patients that showed even if they came into the transplant and had normal bone density, because we measured the, in our, in our epidemiologic study, we measured bone density before transplant, and we found there really wasn't much bearing on whether or not somebody had a uh, normal bone density. They could still fracture. So at the time, we were recommending pretty much everybody be treated. And so I think that's what they did. They didn't have any entry criteria for their bone density to be low before they were treated. This is a study that we did. It was published in the New England Journal in 2004. Um, we, we compared calcitriol versus alendronate after heart transplant. This was a randomized double-blind, double-dummy study of almost 150 patients, and they were randomized to one of those two treatments within tw uh, four weeks of transplant. Um, they had got either a lendronate 10 milligrams a day because that was before really it became a weekly drug or calcitriol 0.25 micrograms twice a day. And they were treated for the first 12 months and then we stopped and reevaluated. We didn't have a placebo controlled group because we felt it would be unethical since we had documented such high rates of bone loss just a few years earlier. So, but we did have a reference group of 27 people who didn't, were transplanted at the same time as these other people but didn't want to be in the study, but they did ag agree to have their bone densities followed over time. And these are the de uh, BMD data. Um, the alendronate group is in blue, the calcitriol group is in orange, and the reference group is in purple squares. So um, you can see that at the lumbar spine, these two, there was no significant difference between the alendronate group and the calcitriol group in terms of the decline in bone density, which was under 2 percent. I think it was 1.6 um, percent the, in the calcitriol group and 0.7 percent in the alendronate group, whereas the, um, the uh, reference group lost about 3.2 percent. Similarly, at the femoral rec, no difference between the two um, study groups but the reference group lost 6% over the first year. And at the total hip, again, no difference between the two randomized groups and the, the uh, reference group lost 4.5% four, four uh, over, the, over the first year. Um, in terms of fractures, we had a, been expecting a much higher fracture rate in the, um, in the reference group than we actually saw. We saw a fracture rate of 14%, whereas we had seen 35% in our prior study. And we did have 7% um, in the alendronate group fractured and 4% in the calcitriol group. If you grouped those two treated groups together, this was a significant difference. But the and New England Journal wouldn't let us do that. They had made us do a three-way analysis. So there wasn't a significant difference in vertebral fractures, and there was no difference in non-vertebral fractures. Four to five percent of people had non-verts. Um, what about after that first year? So we, we had about almost 60 patients who completed the alendronate calcitriol study on their assigned study drug, and then we had another 16 reference patients, and we followed them for another 12 months without any intervention. In order to be in that second extension study, they had to have a T-score of above minus 2.5 at 12 months. We didn't follow them if they were actually osteoporotic, but if they were above that, we followed them. And we hypothesized that bone density would decline in the council trial group because it's here today and gone tomorrow. It has a very short half-life, and once you stop it, the effect goes away. Uh, but alendronate, as you know, stays in the skeleton for a very long time, so we thought that bone density would decline in the calcitriol trial group and remain stable in the alendronate group. But what we found is there was no further decline in bone density in any of the three groups, the reference, the alendronate, or the calcitriol trial group, and we didn't see any incident fractures. So I think what this tells us is that if you get to the end of this bad first year where the steroid doses are higher and everything's, you know, it's just a tough year for the patients. They go through a lot that first year. Many of them are sick with a variety of things. They're bedridden a lot. It's not like they just have their transplant and then they walk out and resume a normal life. 
But if you can get through that year and you have a relatively normal bone density at that time, you can stop treatment and just observe without going into a rapid bone loss type of phase at the end of a year. So it's like a window in time or a slice of life between transplant and the end of the year that if you can get through that with preserving your skeleton, then you probably are okay after that for a while. Not to say you shouldn't be monitored, but okay. We then did a study looking at alendronate versus solidronic acid after a heart or a liver transplant. And we kind of hypothesized that, we I did hypothesize that a single infusion of zoledronic acid that was administered within the first month after transplant would provide protection from bone loss that was comparable to weekly alendronate initiated at the same time. So that was what we did, and we had um, 84 patients, heart or liver, and they were not heart and liver, heart or liver, randomized during the first month after transplant um, to either one single five milligram um, uh, infusion of zoledronic acid um, or placebo, or a weekly alendronate, 70 milligrams a week for a year, or placebo. So it was double dummy. And then we had the similar, we took a similar approach and had a non-randomized reference group. And all patients, because we had just gotten that data showing at the marked prevalence of vitamin D deficiency, we gave them all high ergocalciferol, 50,000 units a day for five days before the zoledronic acid infusion because there were reports in the literature of marked hypocalcemia after zoledronic acid in patients who are very vitamin D deficient. So we did that as a safety measure. They all got calcium, 1,000 milligrams a day, and vitamin D, 1,000 units a day. <coughs> and we got some interesting results. Here are the bone density data at the spine. So the zoledronic acid group is in blue, the alendronate group is in red, and the reference group is in green. And this is uh, at the lumbar spine, and these are the heart transplant patients. So in the heart transplant patients, alendronate didn't seem to work to prevent the bone loss. There was about 2 to 3 percent bone loss, and alendronate didn't have any effect on that, but zoledronic acid did. Conversely, in the liver transplant recipients, both alendronate and uh, zoledronic acid increased bone density uh, while it declined in the uh, reference group. And at the hip, we, did, we saw a decline, a significant decline in the reference group and no decline at the hip in either treated group, at the total hip, and also the same thing at the femoral neck. So um, we concluded, based on that, that there still remains some significant bone loss, about 3% during the first year in untreated treated patients after a heart or liver transplant, that there was no hip bone loss with either zoledronic acid or alendronate. In the liver transplant recipients, both zoledronic acid and alendronate prevented bone loss at the spine. And in the heart transplant recipients, zoledronic acid provided greater protection at the spine than alendronate. And why that would be, I don't know. Here is a study, the only study that I'm aware of, of denosumab in a transplant situation. This was a study done in Switzerland looking at two um, uh, doses of denosumab. They were randomized uh, to denosumab or placebo, 90 patients. They received their first dose within two weeks of transplant. And um, you can see that the, uh, there was an increase in bone density at the lumbar spine in the group that got to nosumab, which is in the blue circle, and there was really a, a temporary decline at the lumbar spine, but then they were back to baseline by 12 months in the uh, placebo group. And at the total hip, similar picture, the denosumab improved bone density, and the control patients uh, did not lose any bone and didn't gain any bone. The, there were some safety concerns, and um, there was an increased frequency of urinary tract infections, which is not something you want in a kidney transplant patient. Uh, the incidence of other infections was similar. And the other concern is hypocalcemia. Um, it was increased in the, um, in the treated patients. 
And also there have been reports of patients who've had severe hypocalcemia after transplant, um, uh, after heart or lung transplant. Um, and the lower their estimated GM, GFR uh, is, the greater risk they have of becoming hypocalcemic. Yes? I was just wondering, uh, other than the, you know, the safety and some of the other things may be a little different for transplant, for the, you know, all these trials looking at different dysphosphonates or whatever drugs for transplant, is there a thought that it will be very, the results are supposed to be very different from you know, non-transplant? I know that everybody does, you know, treatment, both men and women, but, like, you know, their own category, but is there a thought that pathophysiology would be markedly different? Like, are they expecting that for Well, I mean, I think that the pathophysiology is different yeah. because I think that in no other situation do you get this uncoupling that you see. Now, I think that nowadays the pathophysiology is not as clear-cut as it was before. It's probably because before we had high doses of steroids and now liver transplant patients are basically off steroids by three months. Kidney transplant patients may never see steroids. Heart transplant patients usually are on steroids for at least five months, five to six months, and lung transplant patients, last time I looked into it, are pretty much persistently on steroids. So it's basically a form of steroid-induced osteoporosis with a particular um, uh, increase that you don't necessarily see with just plain steroids in resorption. So I don't think that we could have said back then that the pathophysiology was the same as any other form of osteoporosis. I think that there was more of an uncoupling reaction, which, you know, I mean, we hoped it would work, and it did seem to work, but you have to prove it's going to work. You can't just say, well, it works here, so it's going to work there. You know. Um, where am I? Right. Okay. So, what could we be doing today to prevent post-transplant fractures? Uh, well, um, you know, a lot of people aren't doing anything. Um, and that's because even though a lot of the intervention studies did show preservation of bone density, the majority were small fractures. You know from looking at studies of postmenopausal osteoporosis and even steroid-induced osteoporosis, you need hundreds of people, thousands of people in order to show that there's a, a reduction in the risk of fracture. And most of these studies, 90, 150, you know, there's just not enough in any one study to, to show a reduce, reduction in the risk of fractures. And many of these studies are tiny. So um, even though four of the studies did find a reduction in the re risk of fracture, others found no significant decrease, or they didn't even report it because it was irrelevant because the numbers were so small. So because of the fact that we're all very attuned to we're not doing anything unless we show that it decreases the risk of fractures, a lot of people have not, have been reluctant to implement prevention strategies after transplant. And I think as time has gone by and the situation has improved, there's probably less reason to than there was 20 years ago. 20 years ago it was devastating and a lot of people were getting it. Now we're having a couple of the percent declines and maybe it's not necessary, you know, but you still have to take into consideration that if you come to a transplant with a T-score of minus 2.5 or minus 3 because well, whatever brought you to transplant or happened to you before and you lose 2 or 3 percent rapidly, it's not good. So now, whereas 20 years ago I would have said everybody should be treated regardless uh, for the first year and then reevaluate, now I would take a much more um, you know, risk-driven approach, and we'll come to that in a second. So we did a meta-analysis just to address this fracture um, issue. Um, we wanted to, to determine whether treatment with a bisphosphonate or an active D analog did reduce the risk of fracture in the first post-transplant year. And it, to be included, they had to be a in this study, in this meta-analysis, they had to be a randomized clinical trial, a solid organ transplant, the patients had to be followed from the time of transplant forward. There had to be a treatment and a control group, even if it wasn't placebo controlled. Fractures had to be assessed by x-ray, and they either had to get oral or IV bisphosphonates or an active <coughs> DEMA analog. And we excluded studies with historical controls, other treatments like hormone replacement or calcitonin or exercise. We excluded children, and we excluded studies comparing two treatments. 
And we, so there were 11 studies that met those inclusion and exclusion criteria. And you can see that um, they uh, encompassed heart, liver, kidney, and then one study had heart and lung transplant in it. And that we, there were a variety of treatments given from IV to oral, and then the last two studies here were active metabolites of vitamin D. And uh, here we have the results when we combined bisphosphonates or active D metabolites into the analysis. There were 11 studies, 780 patients of whom 134, <coughs> fractured, 134 fractures, and when the, pa the untreated patients, a quarter of them fractured. So um, when we look at the panel on your left, uh, the subjects with fractures, we used a, a fixed effect model, and we found about a 50% reduction in the in the in the subjects, the number of subjects who fractured, and then there was a 76% re um, reduction, significant reduction in vertebral fractures, and then in total fractures, a 63% reduction, and all of these were statistically significant. When we looked at the studies that included bisphosphonates alone, so there's now nine studies, fewer patients, 737 and 116 fractures. We did find a 50 percent significant reduction in the number of subjects with fractures, and we found a 66 percent reduction that was not statistically significant in the number of vertebral fractures, and a 61 percent reduction in total fractures, also not significant, probably because of power issues. So just to summarize, I mean, it's a meta-analysis, so it had limitations. The studies were heterogeneous. The reported data quality was variable. We didn't have any access to the raw data or very limited access. And these were older studies, so they may not be generalizable to patients on newer immunosuppressive regimens. But at least I think that provides some evidence that treatment, either with bisphosphonates or vitamin D, during the first year is associated with a reduced risk of fracture, or at least it was. So what are we doing today? So given, as I mentioned before, that there are lower rates of bone loss and fracture than we used to see, I think it's probably very reasonable to use a bone density and steroid-driven approach. So, so this is sort of my ideal thing, that before or at time of transplant, we would uh, recommend getting a DEXA scan and spine radiographs to make sure there are no prevalent vertebral fractures, and measure vitamin D. And then do a fracture risk assessment with FRACS or whatever you want to do it. But if the patient is over 50, these are risk factors for fracture after transplant. If they're a postmenopausal woman, if they've already had a prior fracture, if they have diabetes, or if they have a low T-score, then they're probably at higher risk of fracture after the transplant. Give everybody vitamin D and replete them to a level of 30, which is, and then inc make sure that they have a total intake of calcium from all sources of about 1,000 milligrams. The American College of Rheumatology just published their 2017 guidelines for management of glucocorticoid-induced uh, glucose osteoporosis, and they recommend treating so adult solid organ transplant recipients who have an estimated GFR above 30 and who continue on glucocorticoids after the transplant according to their general guidelines. So um, to basically give them a bisphosphonate if they uh, are going to stay on steroids for more than three months or one month depending on the group. To treat patients at a moderate or high risk for fracture using whatever way you want to decide, decide what their risk is. To refer all renal transplant to metabolic bone experts because they're very complicated and difficult to manage, and they do not recommend denosumab because of their concern about the safety. So, um, so in terms of treatment allocation, this is sort of how I do it, it's not necessarily the right way, but if I see that the patient has a T-score that doesn't have to be frankly osteoporotic, but if it's in the osteopenic range below minus 1.5, whether or not they have a prevalent fracture or otherwise at high fracture risk, I would treat them with a bisphosphonate whether or not they were on steroids. If their T-score is above minus 1.5 and they do have either a prevalent fracture or they're otherwise at high fracture risk, uh, 
I would also treat them whether or not they were going to be on prednisone. Um, if their T-score is above minus uh, 2.5 and they are not at high fracture risk or they don't have a high uh, a prevalent fracture and they're not on prednisone, then I would observe those people. So if your bone density is pretty good, you're not really going to be on prednisone for any length of time, you don't really have osteoporosis now and you don't have a lot of risk factors for fracture, then I think you could observe that patient. But if they are going to be on steroids, then I would treat them for at least while they're on steroids. And, you know, I think that if you're going to do this, you should treat people immediately post-transplant and not wait, you know, because what you're trying to do is get them through that first year without an untoward event of a fracture. And a little bit of bisphosphonate is a very low risk type of thing for a year to do. So uh, that would be my philosophy. Yes? So if you have a patient for a renal transplant. OK, I'm coming to that now. Oh. Okay. So that was for everything but renal. <laughs> so if you have a kidney transplant, um, you know, it's, uh, it's much more controversial. First of all, nephrologists hate bisphosphonate. They uh, th are worried about the fact that these patients may already have low turnover bone disease, that bisphosphonates could suppress them further and cause even more adynamic bone disease or cause secondary hyperparathyroidism. And they are, once they're there, they're there, and they have a very prolonged residence in bone and a long duration of action. And um, even though it's been shown time and time again that they improve bone density, they also feel that there's no fair evidence that they prevent fractures, even though it's not that there's evidence that they don't prevent fractures. There's no, not enough evidence that shows that they do. So they, that, you know, my feeling would be I would treat them anyway, but I'm not a nephrologist. So. They think that denosumab could be an option if you're concerned about a suppression of bone resorption. Um, and in a patient with low bone turnover because at least it is reversible in a shorter time than bisphosphonates. I'm not sure I agree with that, but this is something to consider. They don't routinely recommend teriparatide because, um, uh, but they do feel like if you know the patient has very low bone turnover, bone disease and osteoporosis, one could consider teriparatide. The KDGO guidelines, I haven't seen the new one. I don't think they're out yet. but. They suggest for transplant bone disease to, that to measure bone disease during the first three months, if they're receiving steroids or have other risk factors for osteoporosis, and if their bone density is low and the patients within 12 months of transplant consider treatment, and then also consider a bone biopsy to guide treatment before using bisphosphonates because of the high incidence of adynamic bone disease. But the problem with that is by the time you do all that, get a bone biopsy, takes you know a whole bunch of time to label them and a whole bunch of time to get the biopsy, and then you also have to uh, read the biopsy, which takes six weeks, you know, you, you wouldn't really implement therapy in a timely way. So this is a risk-based approach to management after kidney transplant that was pr pr put forward by a Graham Elder in Australia, and what he recommends and does is he um, measures PTH, DEXA, and fine radiographs at transplant. Then two weeks after transplant, he gets PTH and vitamin D and bone turnover markers. And he uses whatever he can, bone out class, P1MP, or CTX. He does a fracture risk assessment, and he gives all patients vitamin D and calcium. And then he has this allocation that's based on bone density, fracture, and turnover. So basically, if the T-score is low, whether or not they have a fracture. If their bone turnover markers are low, meaning they probably have a dynamic bone disease, he would treat with 125. And if they're normal or high, he treats with a bisphosphonate. And similarly, if they have osteopenia and a fracture, he does the same thing. If they have osteopenia and no fracture, he treats, he basically treats everybody. It's just a matter of whether he treats them with 125 or bisphosphonates. He treats them with 125 if they're low and bisphosphonates if they have risk factors and are high, have high, normal bone turnover and bisphosphonates if they have high bone turnover. And then for the 
uh, T-score above zero. If they have a fracture, he treats with 125 or bisphosphonates depending on, on their bone turnover markers and 125 everybody else. So he published this in 153 kidney and kidney pancreas patients. About two-thirds got a bisphosphonate and one-third got 125D and he found that the bone density improved in the bisphosphonate group and didn't change in the 125D group. He didn't find any difference in fractures, no surprise, no difference in rejection or renal function, and he found that all of his markers like serum calcium and PTH were normal at a year. So just to sum up, I think all patients, given the prevalence of bone disease in people coming to transplant, should be evaluated before transplant and receive treatment if they have prevalent osteoporosis. I think if you're going to prevent thera do prevention therapy, it should be initiated immediately after transplant, primarily in patients with risk factors for osteoporosis and fracture like low bone density, and that long-term transplant patients deserve to be monitored with occasional bone densities and treated if bone density problems or fractures come. I think it's clear that bone density, bone, bone loss, and probably fractures can be prevented by early intervention with either bisphosphonates or vitamin D analogs, and that we need additional data on the safety and efficacy of anabolic medications and denosumab. So I think that hopefully I've convinced you that we've made a lot of progress, or someone's made a lot of progress, I'm not sure it's us, maybe the transplant people, in in clarifying what the natural history pathogenesis and potential treatment strategies are for transplant osteoporosis. It's still a significant problem. I still do see patients who have multiple fractures post-transplant, and so I still feel that everybody should be evaluated going into the transplant. But if you really watch for this and you, di you know, take steps to diagnose the problem early, early and treat it if necessary, I think it's a preventable problem and not as devastating anymore. And I just want to thank all my colleagues who worked with me on all this work and the transplant physicians who helped us recruit to our studies and our funding and you for paying attention. Mm -hmm.